This is the ABQ Business Podcast with your host, Jason Rigby. Each week, we'll interview visionary business leaders to inspire the creative power and spirit that's in every entrepreneur. Discussing strengths, weaknesses, strategies, systems, and the problems we can all solve together for a new future for local small business. Hey guys, this is Jason Rigby. Got a a super special guest today. Really excited. I think this is perfect timing in what's going on in the world today. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But I have Dr. Gleb Sapersky. He is known as a disaster avoidance expert. He's internationally recognized thought leader. Dr. Gleb Sapersky is on a mission to protect leaders from dangerous judgment errors known as cognitive biases by developing the most effective decision-making strategies. He has over Two decades of consulting, coaching, and training experience as CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts and over 15 years of experience in academia as a cognitive neuroscience and a behavioral economist. Dr. Uh, Sapersky writes for Inc. Magazine, Time, Scientific America, Fast Company, and Entrepreneur, and he's the best-selling author, and we're going to talk about this book today, is Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid business disaster. How are you doing, doctor? How's it going with the COVID? <laughs> well, we can talk about COVID and decision-making, but for me, because I saw COVID as a serious problem early onward, I took a lot of steps to prepare for it for my household. So I got that prepared. I got my clients prepared. I dragged them screaming and kicking and screaming into preparing, <laughs> actually, because a lot of them were thinking, well, it's you know, not a big deal. Why are you pushing us to do this? And then they're right. really thankful later. So I got them prepared. Uh, I feel pretty good about myself. I mean, I got, you know, I, my publisher approached me to write a book about this very quickly called Resilience, Adapt and Plan for the New Abnormal, the COVID-19 Coronavirus Pandemic. And because... My, a lot of my speaking and training, so I had a lot of speaking and training gigs. They were all canceled. As you can imagine, I had time to oh, work no. on it. Yeah, so right. they were, you know, the book just came out on, uh, when was it? On May 15th. So it's all available mm-hmm. on Amazon and elsewhere. So I'm feeling pretty good, actually. <laughs> well, that's good. I, I know, like, with leadership, especially right now, it just seems uh, like, you know, there's leaders that are, some are being proactive, some aren't, but they don't understand the decision or that decision-making process. And we're going to get into that today. What are you seeing in leadership through this crisis? I'm seeing that leaders are making really bad decisions because of how our brain is wired. And that's not the, my area of expertise, how the wiring of our brain causes us to make bad decisions and how we can improve our decision-making by using some unnatural techniques, counterintuitive techniques, let's say civilized techniques. You know, that's the nature of civilization, going against the natural primitive savage state and being adaptive for the modern world. So some civilized decision-making techniques instead of our natural intuition and tendency to go with our gut. Because our gut reactions, what the research on this topic shows, are not adapted for the modern world. They're adapted for the savanna environment. And that is a really bad place from which to make good decisions about modern world threats. So, for example, in the savanna environment, where gut reactions are main response to threats, was the fight-or-flight response. Now, that was a great response for the savanna environment because, you know, we face saber-toothed tigers. They might have heard of it as the saber-toothed tiger response, where we had to jump at 100 shadows in order to get away from that one saber-toothed tiger. But the fight-or-flight response is terrible for modern-day problems like COVID-19. It's a high-impact, slow-moving train wreck of a disaster. But leaders are responding to it, as, and ordinary people, of course, as though it's a fight-or-flight response. So some people are fleeing from it, and that means ignoring their information. They're saying it's a hoax, it's not a big deal, it's just like the flu, whatever. Not correct, not a good response. That's right. not what it's about. So that's kind of one bad response. The other bad response is the fight response, where they go to their emergency plans, their business continuity plans, and say, yes, let's use our business continuity plans, we're going to fight this thing. Not a good response either, because, I mean, I'm someone as a disaster avoidance expert, I've prepared a lot of business continuity plans, and I can tell you, they're not meant for the slow-moving train wreck. They're meant for a situation where, let's say, you have a flood or a blizzard, not that it happens in Albuquerque, right? <laughs> but <laughs> exactly. something like uh, that sort of situation, an earthquake, you know, more likely to happen. When, you, when Houston was flooded. So Houston was flooded and that you know, was a one to two week interruption. Major, huge disaster. $120 billion of damage done. 
And that's a great time for a business continuity plan. But what we're having here is more like Houston getting flooded and then staying flooded. And then you have to build a canoe and go to your work in a canoe. You know, that's the kind of the parallel. This is not what business continuity plans are for. So people who are using them are making a major mistake there because they're continuing to use a tool that it's not intended for, that it's not intended for. What they need to do is they need to realize what the future has in store for them and plan for the long-term impact of the pandemic. And we can talk about what that means, but what they are not doing that. They're not stepping back. They're not looking at the broader picture, the broader context, the long-term context, and they're making bad decisions because of how our brain is wired. And we can talk about these specific mistakes that they're making in the context of COVID-19 and the specific failure patterns. These are called cognitive biases, dangerous judgment errors that you can learn about and prevent. Yeah, and I, and I know in your book, uh, and I, I want to kind of get into your book a little bit. I know one one of the things that you have right 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 in the beginning of the book is this: making a business decision based on gut reactions come from the same impulse as eating brownies instead yes. of fruit. Yeah, that, and that is a great parallel because in the Savannah environment, you know, the fight or flight response was one element of what we needed to do in order to survive and thrive in the Savannah environment. We're the descendants of all of those who had a great flight, uh, fight or flight response. The others didn't survive. They were a little bit slower in fleeing from the saber tooth tiger. So, you know, they were, they were the ones who were caught. So we're the descendants of those who weren't caught. We are also the descendants of those who are very strongly triggered by sugar. Because when you came mm-hmm. across a source of honey, apples, bananas, whatever. It was very important for you to eat as much of it as possible in order to survive and thrive in the savannah environment. We're the descendants of those who did so. The other people didn't survive. So right now, when you come across, you know, a box of brownies or, you know, a bag of potato chips or a gallon of ice cream, we're very tempted once we start eating it to eat the whole box of brownies, box of donuts, bag of food, chips, you know, even though it says that a serving is, you know, 10 chips or a serving is a cup of ice cream or a serving is one donut, you know, who eats one cup of ice cream? <laughs> Show me that person. You know, you start eating it, you eat the half the gallon. That's the tendency, even though you might think to yourself that you'll eat that you'll only eat one cup of ice cream because we get triggered. And in the modern environment, hopefully folks know that that's a bad idea to eat a box of dozen donuts at once or a whole bag of potato chips or a jug of, or a gallon of ice cream. You know that. So we are take, we take steps to protect our physical fitness, to protect our ability to have a good body, a good health, physical health. But we don't do nearly enough to protect our mental fitness, to protect our minds, to make the right decisions. We still go with our, we don't go with our natural primitive instincts on eating, but we go with them on decision-making. It's ridiculous because the mind, of course, is so much more important than the body in the modern world. You know, our body was more important when we were laborers, farmers, and so on, you know, 100 years ago. Right now, the mind is the main source of your value. That is where your value comes from, especially for leaders. But most professionals in the modern world are information professionals. Your mind is the source of your value. And we don't train our mind. We don't develop our mental fitness, even though it's much more important than physical fitness. And developing our mental fitness is something that people don't know about, they don't do, and they get so much damage, so much pain from doing it, whether in the face of COVID-19 or other everyday decisions, business decisions. Yeah, and, and in your book, you talk about that we should never trust our instincts or intuitions and, you know, with our gut. And, but I mean, literally you could go out there and see websites and coaching programs and book after book, self-help book of this. Why should we never trust our instincts or intuitions? Yes, there are plenty of business gurus who tell you to go with your gut and, of course, political leaders of all sorts and who tell you to go with your gut. Civic leaders, all sorts of people tell you to go with your gut. Why is that? Well, it's very comfortable for us to go with our gut, just like it's very comfortable to eat a box of, to eat a whole big, huge chocolate chip brownie. You know, that's very tempting You know, with mint chocolate chip ice cream. It's delicious. It's tempting to eat a whole gallon of ice cream. That is what feels comfortable for us. It feels right. Right. It feels good. That's what feels right. And that's what our gut tells us to do. That is something that 
people like to hear others tell them to do what they already want to do. And you imagine if your you know, doctor tells you to, hey, you know, go get that gallon of ice cream and sit on the couch and watch Netflix all day. That's right on. That's great for your health. Wouldn't it feel nice to hear that? You know, yes, I want, I want to go to that doctor, right? <laughs> That's the doctor I want. That's the physical trainer I want who tells me to do that. It's desirable, right? It's pleasant. It's very bad for us to do that. Similarly, it's very bad for us to go with our gut on business decisions because what we feel comfortable with in business is very often exactly the wrong thing to do. So, for example, we talked about COVID-19. One of the biggest problems, dangerous judgment errors relating to COVID-19 is called the normalcy bias. The normalcy bias is our tendency to judge the short-term and medium-term future by the past. In the Savannah environment, it was great because our future was pretty much like our past. So we're not going to change much in the future. You know, it's still going to be that cycle of seasons, you know, go out and hunt the mammoth, you know, every time that the mammoth herds pass by and so on. You know, every time the raspberries ripen, go out and harvest raspberries, right? That, that was a safe assumption. In the modern environment, we face so many right. disruptors, whether it's technology disruptors, whether it's fiscal disruptors like the 2008-2009 fiscal crisis or the COVID-19 pandemic. We face these disruptors, but we don't feel like they're disruptors. So many people don't realize that we can never go back to December 2019. That world, that life is over. So many people right now, business leaders are saying, let's go back to normal. You know, Tesla is saying, let's open up the factories. Let's go back to normal. Elon Musk is saying at least, you know, everything is fine. That's a very bad idea. This is not what the reality is. Right now, states are opening up restrictions. And what are you going to see? You're going to see inevitably shooting up of cases. So cases will increase. COVID-19 cases will increase. That's just the reality of the situation. And no one denies that this is the reality, that it will increase. Before medical systems are overwhelmed, as happened in New York City, as happened in Italy, the most, at least, governors, most municipalities will impose restrictions because they can't afford the political cost. And we're not even talking about the morals. You know, this is what morals are a separate question. They can't afford the political cost of having body bags coming out of hospitals into refrigerated trucks. That's very, that looks very bad on TV. Let's just be honest about it. So regardless of whether you think that they should be closing down or whether they shouldn't be closing down, they are going to be closing down. My opinion doesn't matter about what they should be doing. Yours doesn't either. They will be closing down. So reality is, until we have a vaccine, you'll be seeing waves of restrictions and loosenings, restrictions and loosenings, and going on for the next couple of years until we get a vaccine. And we won't get a vaccine until the summer of the earliest summer of 2021. And then it'll take at least six months to produce enough with, to vaccinate people, distribute it, and so on. This is the most optimistic timeline. The most optimistic timeline is we'll deal with COVID-19 by the beginning of 2022. Very unlikely to, to hit that optimistic timeline because, as you've heard a number of health experts say, everything, you know, all the ducks have to line up in a row and you have to hit all your milestones. It's unlikely to happen. So likely it'll right. be late on that. Business leaders are not prepared for them. They're not thinking about that long-term consequences. The market is so ridiculous. The stock market is you know, <laughs> near, near an all-time high. This is right. crazy. The stock market is not pricing in the reality of the situation. So many business leaders are not thinking about the reality of the situation. They're falling into this normalcy bias. They want a normal world. And they feel that because they want it, they can get it by just going out and acting as though the world is normal and the virus no longer exists. That's wishful thinking. <laughs> That's right, another right. type of cognitive bias that I talk about in the book. You know, so one is normalcy bias, our feeling that the future will be normal. And another one is wishful thinking, where we let our desire for a certain conclusion very much influence our judgment, our decision making. That's very dangerous, very harmful, a lot of bad decisions Business decisions come from whether recruitment decisions, M and A acquisitions, so many you know, product launches, which as I'm sure you know, most product launches fail. Lots of bad business decisions come from this sort of thinking, wishful thinking. Yeah, and you, you and one of the things that you you say, and I love this word because you keep saying like feels or feeling is internal impulse. Yes. So, so. Why, why do we? Why, why are we so into believing this internal impulse? Why do our brains look at it and say this is the truth? 
they simp- this is simply what feels comfortable to us. Our emotions, how we feel, determine about 80 to 90% of our decision making. This is just fundamental reality. This is what the research in neuroscience and behavioral economics shows. We are very much driven by emotions. We're emotional creatures. And when I talk about this, people get really surprised. They think, you know, I wrote about never go with your gut. I must be a cold, rational, logical Mr. Spock type. Not at all. I'm very concerned with our emotions because our emotions drive us to make good decisions and they drive us to make bad decisions. So the key is not to ignore your emotions. You should never ignore your emotions. Your emotions are incredibly important for motivation, for directing you in certain directions. What you want to do is train yourself to have the right habits. Just like, you know, the right answer is not to avoid all food. That's not the right answer in your physical fitness. That's not the right answer. You want to train yourself to, instead of getting a box of dozen donuts and keeping you know, your stock full of of ice cream, jugs of ice cream, you want to buy fruit instead of that. Maybe, you know, once a month buy buy some ice cream, something like that to maintain your physical health. You can do that. You can make those choices when you're not triggered by sugar. When you're in a calm, cool, reflective state, you can say, hey, here's what my groceries list will look like. When you're actually eating the ice cream, that's not the time to try to decide to stop eating the ice cream or to start eating the fruit because you're triggered. That is when you're emotionally triggered. You can in, Instead, you can manage your emotions. You can influence your emotions in a state when you're calm, cool, and collected. Still aware, very much aware of your emotions. It's incredibly important to have strong emotional intelligence, to be aware when your emotions are driving you in the wrong direction, rather than what the large majority of people do is feel, then do. You know, Go with your gut reactions. When they feel something is right, then that's the right thing. That's They equate what feels right with what is right. And mm, they so make good. so that's... many mistakes. That is the fundamental, basic. Fo- if I can to- have people take away the one thing from this podcast, they should know that whatever feels right is not necessarily right at all. They need to differentiate between what is right for their business, for their career, for their personal life as well, from what feels right. You know, when your spouse says something hurtful and aggressive to you, the right response is not to say something hurtful and aggressive back. (laughs) (laughs) That is something that leads to about, you know, 40% of all marriages failing because people do that. (laughs) That is not the right response. The right response is to figure out, oh, honey, you, you seem upset, you know, help me understand, you know, what's going on? You, what, what's up with you? So empathize, see what's going on, respond effectively, and then figure out what are the emotions causing your spouse to say something that you perceive as hurtful. Maybe, you know, maybe she didn't perceive it as hurtful. Maybe she thought, maybe she was just thoughtless, didn't realize how it would strike you. Or maybe, you know, she was upset that you left the seat up again and, you know, she said something mean because you left the seat up happens plenty of times. Same thing happens in business all the time. I can't tell you the number of miscommunications that happen because of and tensions and conflicts that happen because of personality problems where, you know, you hate somebody's guts and that hating of somebody's guts comes from an emotional place, right? Then that, of course, causes you a lot of business problems that are not great. So that is a big problem that we have to deal with in order to understand that our emotions are not necessarily right at all about whether re- external reality matches our emotions or not. Yeah, and, and in the book, uh, you have these this eight-step decision-making model, and then through every chapter, you kind of reiterate it. And then in the stories that you have, and we'll get into some of those, in the stories that you have, you kind of show the process of it. And so I, I, I feel like this is the engine of the book. This is really, if, we wanted to, if somebody wants to take away something today, being able to get your book one and you can get it on Amazon, but to be able to take these eight steps, write them down and then go through processes that you're trying to deal with and, and just go through all eight of them. I, d- I did that this morning and it was, it was very interesting, but on the eight step decision-making model, I, I kind of want to go through them quickly if we could. But number one is identify the need for a decision to be made. That's right. So the first step you'll want to, so I'll, I'll be happy to go through them and then give an example of how it applies. Give an example of how it applies, let's yeah. say, to, to your career. So the first step, you want to be able to identify the need for a decision to be made. This sounds surprising. And then this is, again, these are eight steps that you take for major decisions, serious decisions, ones you don't want to screw up and you want to get as good as possible. That right. is, this is what it's about. So the first step is identifying the need for a decision to be made. It can be surprisingly hard to do that. Most people don't think of, oh, identify obviously the decision needs to be made. It's not obvious at all. I mean, 
or talking about COVID-19, how many people didn't make a decision about the preparing for COVID-19 when they really should have, when there was information available about COVID-19, the dangers of COVID-19. Lots of people had this information, but they cho- but they didn't choose to make the right decisions about it. So that's one type of problem. And there are so many problems like this in business. So I'll give an example. Well, think about Kodak in uh, the 1990s when, when it was... Uh, looking at what was happening with digital cameras, right? It was saying that, you know, Kodak, if, I don't know if you know that, but they actually invented the digital camera in 1983. The oh, engineer wow. invented the digital camera. But what happened with Kodak was that their film business of the physical film was much more profitable. So when in early 1990s, when they were looking at what was happening, they're saying, okay, digital is becoming more popular, but film is much more profitable. Film had a profit margin of about around 63%. Digital had a profit margin of just under half that. So they decided that, hey, we'll just stick with physical. You know, we will not go digital. And eventually what Kodak found out is that... Zero percent, you know, sixty percent of zero is still going to be zero when yes. film was way overtaken by digital. By contrast, think about Fujifilm. Fujifilm, which is still around right now, it's about six billion dollar business, had the same sort of issue. It was facing the same sort of issue in the early nineteen nineties, and it was evaluating, you know, should we go forward? Should we go to digital? Should we go physical? And they had the same profit model, of course, because physical was much mo- more lucrative than digital. But what they decided was, and they saw very clearly that the future is going digital. So what they did was they chose to maximize the benefits, pull out them as much profit as they could from their physical business and invest it into digital. And they successfully made this transition. So that's an example of how you want to identify the need for a decision to be made. Then Gather relevant information from a variety of perspectives. You want to talk to a variety of people, people with whom you might disagree, people who don't have the same perspective as you. You want to especially value those who have a different mode of thinking. So, for example, I'll talk about myself. One of my cognitive biases, biggest problems for me, these dangerous judgment errors, is called the optimism bias. I'm the kind of person who has 20 ideas before breakfast, and I think all of them are brilliant. I am <laughs> looking at, you know, this is, I'm look, I always look at opportunities. I ignore threats. This is just how I'm wired. I have high expectations of myself and of other people. Too high, as I learned to my bitter regret. <laughs> so that, you know, I think the world is a nice place and I think the grass is green on the other side of the hill even though it's sometimes yellow so that's a problem for me that is not good I like to work with other people who are optimistic. You know, I run a six people consulting, coaching, and training company. It's very tempting for me to hire other people who are optimistic because I click well with them. You know, we reinforce each other's ideas. But what I learned I need to do is make sure to hire people with the opposite bias, with the pessimism bias. The pessimism bias, kind of like it sounds, people who see the world as a threatening place. They focus on risks. They don't look at opportunities. So they don't. They're very bad at generating ideas. They don't have 20 ideas before breakfast. But what happens is that when I give them my 20 ideas before breakfast, they look at them and they say, well, you know, these are all half-baked potatoes, but here are the three least worst of them. You know, they say they're least worst. I think they're the best, from my perspective, the three best ideas, and they say these are the three least worst ideas. So you can see kind of the difference of perspectives. But then they can fix the flaws in them because they see the exaggerated flaws of each idea, and then they can improve them into implementing it effectively going forward. That's their strength. But, you know, if it was a company of all optimists, then we'd each have 20 ideas before breakfast. So six people, 120 okay, okay. ideas, would be running in different directions. And that would be pretty terrible for the future of the business, right? Not good. So that's uh, one of the major reasons that a lot of startups fail is because they are not nearly focused enough. They run out of cash, one of the two biggest reasons for startup failure. And of course, about half of all startups fail within the first five years, three quarters fail within the first 15 years. One of the major, two major reasons is they run out of cash because they're doing too much stuff. Don't want to have that to happen to me. Third, stop. Decide on the goals, painting a clear vision of the desired outcome. So many people don't do that. They just say, you know, I want more money, right? Like that's the, that's the reason why I do things. That's a bad idea. You want a clear vision of the kind of future you want for yourself. What do you want five years from now? You know, I have no idea, for example, why did Sears and Kmart merge? 
why <laughs> two failing, you know, two similarly priced, similar market failing uh, retailers merged to create a large failing retailer? Why? <laughs> that is dumb. <laughs> Not a good idea at all. So that's that's bad. Then develop clear decision making criteria to evaluate options. That's the fourth one. So let's say you want to hire a key person for your company. What are the decision making criteria that you have? You can have criteria like, you know, obviously salary. So salary for would be one. Another one would be experience in the business. Let's say you you are transitioning your business to your to your daughter. Let's say you're leaving your dad in your daughter and you want somebody who would be very experienced coming in. This is what happened to my client recently. Do you want someone who would very be very experienced come in to help mentor your daughter as she is taking charge of the family business that as right. the COO. So that's that's something, you know, a lot of experience. Then you want somebody who would be a good fit for the company. So fit for the company, that's another criteria and other criteria that you want. And then weigh the criteria. Which one is most important? Salary, experience, fit for the business. So the client that I was talking about recently, they were doing pretty well. So the salary was less of a concern. They We weighed that on a scale of one to 10 as a four, uh, the salary requirements. Then the experience was really important. That was a nine. And the fit was really important. That was a seven. And then the next one, of course, five, generate viable options to achieve your goals. That and if you're trying to hire someone, that's, of course, how many people you're going to see who you really want to have. One of the biggest problems I see with leaders is that they rush through the steps. They rush for the steps of generating viable options because they just want to get to the next problem and the next problem and the next problem. They don't realize how many problems they'll cause themselves by <laughs> rushing through this process. Because you know, if you don't hire the right person, you'll have so many negative repercussions down the road. You want at least five people who you'll be happy with or five viable options on whatever decision who you'll feel really happy with, really satisfied with, so you can make the best choice of them. And then weigh these options, picking the best of the bunch. So here is where you use your criteria of salary, you know, fit for the company, experience, whatever other criteria to rank the various options. So that's the part of the decision-making criteria that you're actually going for the decision. The next part is the implementation of the decision. So it's step seven and eight. Seven, implementing the option you chose. There are two steps here that are really important to think about. First, minimizing failure, minimizing the chance of failure. To do that, you want to imagine this decision absolutely failed, completely failed, you know, atrociously failed. So let's say your new hire really failed. Imagine why did this new hire fail? So with the the client, with my client, what we were thinking about, hey, why did this new COO fail? Maybe they failed because they weren't flexible enough for all the new visions and ideas that the daughter had for the business. So they were really stuck in their ways. And that was definitely one of the points of potential failure. So we made sure to have questions and scenarios that we played by the five final candidates to evaluate how flexible they would be in various options and how creative they would be. So that's one of the ways that you address failure. Then how do you maximize success? The second part of number seven, you don't only simply want to avoid failure. That's satisficing. Satisficing is good enough for an everyday daily choice. But here you want to make the best choice possible. So you don't simply want to satisfy, you want to maximize. So for implementing the option that you chose, how can you maximize success for this new person? So one of the ways to maximize success, we thought, was to make sure to have this person have regular 360 evaluations throughout their first year in the company. So every three months, they would have a 360 evaluation where they would get feedback from everyone. Usually we do a 360 evaluation for the top leadership in the company every year, once a year. But here for this new person, we decided to do it every three months. And that would help them get them feedback, get them on the right track, make sure that they don't fail. Eight, evaluate, last step, evaluate the implementation process and revise as needed. For evaluating, of course, you know, what gets measured gets managed. You know, that's a good phrase. Right. And that's a very important phrase. You want metrics of success for whatever you're doing. For this new, for the new COO, what we made sure to do was to have metrics of success for the 360s, you know, what we wanted, the kind of metrics we wanted the COO to hit. And we wanted to hit 
to have opinions, evaluations of peers just on their feel perception of fit of this COO in the new position. So that was really important, including subordinates as well as as well as peers. So that was the those were the metrics that we have. And the COO is a month into the position, so we'll see how the, the COO does. And of course, it's a more difficult position because of COVID-19, but that we took that into account as we were making the transition. So that's the eight-step process that you need to use in, if you want to maximize the decision. You've really made your decisions, ones you really don't want to screw up, and you want to get the best result possible. I love that. And, and in the book, you talk about decision disasters and you give two examples. And if you could elaborate on both of these, because I, I really love these examples. One, you talk about Equifax and then the other one, you talk about um, a sports team with Moneyball. Yes. So Equifax is a great example. If you remember the data breach of Equifax, where Equifax data, its data was breached in about 180 million or, or so people's information was stolen, including actually mine. So I was one of the people whose information oh, wow. was stolen, but about, you know, 180 million is about half full American. So I had a 50-50 chance <laughs> of having my information <laughs> stolen, right? So uh, what happened with Equifax? So that... What, for folks who don't know the details, that the, first of all, that data breach was entirely preventable. It was due to a bug in their system, which the FBI informed them about a while, if, uh, several, a couple of months at least, before the breach. So they should have known that it was going to be, that it, they needed to fix this. There was actually a December 2018 congressional report, and the breach was in uh, May 2017. In December 2018, the Congress evaluated the situation and said that the breach was entirely preventable. So that they mm -hmm. really could have done it. They, there's no question that they could have prevented it. That's a big problem. But even worse than the you you know you, you hear the phrase the cover up is worse than the than the, the crime. In this case, it was really worse than the crime. They waited for several months to mm. until to reveal the situation. This was terrible. This was very very bad because my information and uh, you know 180 million Americans. You know, first when I was writing the book, it was 150 million Americans. After afterward, it came out that 30 more million Americans their information was stolen. So our information was getting sold on the black market to, to various crime syndicates for those several months until September 2017. Mm -hmm. You know, from May 2017 to say September 2017, it was getting sold. And we could have, of course, put a credit freeze on our information and not get our IDs stolen, not get our credit cards screwed up, credit scores screwed up. But Equifax chose to hide it and it thought that, you know, maybe it could just make this problem go away. Very much wishful thinking. <laughs> and that was a big, big problem. So as a result of this situation with Equifax, eventually when it was discovered, the scandal was much, much worse than it could have been. And of course, a number of uh, their leaders were for the CEO, a number of other leaders were forced out because of this super incompetent, <laughs> super incompetence handling of the situation. And you know what? Equifax is not the only one. Of course, there were a number of other data breaches where we found out, you know, a couple of months after the data breach, it was just Equifax was the worst and they actually had a lot more valuable information stolen, my information, other people's information that hackers can use to create false cards and so on. But Google had this, a number of other companies had this, Marriott had this. So it's not the only one, but they learned from Equifax. They told people about the situation quite a bit earlier than Equifax did. <laughs> Yeah, and, and and on the opposite side, you had in the book, you had an example of, I, and I think it was the, was it the Oakland, um, I'm not a baseball fan, but I saw the movie with, uh, you know, Moneyball. That's right. Um, That's right. And, and they did something that was totally unique and different at the time. They did. They did something that was really cool with baseball. And what they did was that they used math, statistics, what I talk about in the book is probabilistic thinking, to figure out what are actually the right strategies for baseball, not going with their gut. So for previously, how, how baseball was recruited, how new people were recruited for a baseball team, was that recruiters, the, they went out and uh, they, the scout, they scouted players and 
they felt that, hey, this player looks good to me, so let's bring them in, and then if the player looks good to the manager, that they would get that player. That's That was the old school method. That's how they did that. They trusted the scout's intuition. That was a problem because the scout's intuition was very much similar to each other, and their intuition often led them astray in the same ways using these cognitive biases because of these cognitive biases that I talk about. So what the manager did, new manager, Billy Bean, he he did some bean counting where he looked at quantitative data and statistics to choose players, the ones who were shown by statistics, not by what the scouts felt, but the statistics showing how well they actually did in various positions in the team. And then he got players who were undervalued, who uh, the scouts were ignoring because of various factors, that they didn't fit the typical scout model of what they wanted to see. And he brought these people in, and then he made a team that was much, much better than than the typical team out there. The Oakland Athletics won 20 games in a row. 20 games in a row. That's crazy for baseball. That's record, literally record-breaking. Of course, since then, other teams started using this approach. They started using quantitative numbers to evaluate what are the right players to hire, what are the right strategies to hire, and so on. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if CEOs and other key players were determined not by how well they can interview and how you know by how charismatic they are, by whether they can persuade the board of directors that they are going to be you know the next uh, best things in sliced bread, <laughs> if instead they we can use numbers and evaluate their past performance and see here's how they did well, here's what they do could have done better, and then get them hired. We know from extensive, extensive research that there are so many CEOs who are hired who are very bad CEOs, very bad, very problematic. So for example, CEOs, very often they get hired because they show confidence. You know, they show confidence and confidence is associated with leadership and the right. CEOs who get who show that confidence, who get up front and you know, kind of bang their chest, that alpha male in the alpha monkey in the room, they're the ones who get hired. Unfortunately, if you look at the research and if you look at the data on these topics, these CEOs make terrible decisions. For example, the more overconfident they are, uh, as shown, let's say, by how often they appear in the media with glowing articles about profiles of CEOs, the more these types of articles tend to appear in the media, the more these CEOs overpay for companies that they purchase, the M&As, the more they overpay and the worse the outcome of the M&A. So if you look at the consequences, just one study, just one type of study, and there are so many similar studies which show that overconfident CEOs hire bad people and that they make bad decisions as a result. This is a big problem that we equate leadership with confidence and not look at the actual track record of the person. You look at how, what kind of narratives the person spins about themselves, what kind of stories they tell. We are very vulnerable to stories. This is a cognitive bias called the narrative fallacy. We like the world to make sense, to be simple. Stories are simple. Stories about the right. future of a company are simple, are clear, and they make sense. This is bad. They should not make sense. <laughs> this seem, might seem counterintuitive. There are a lot of counterintuitive strategies. But the reason they shouldn't make sense is because the world is actually a very complex place with so many contradictory dynamics and dimensions going on. There's nothing purely good. There's nothing purely bad. If you have someone summarizing the idea of a company, its strategy, in a simple story that says, you know, this is great, this is wonderful, there's no way that, you know, this will fail in any you know, shape, sense, or form, which is so often what CEOs do. That's what they say. You know, this is a great vision, nothing will go wrong, this is perfect, this is wonderful. Well, you know, you think that that CEO is like the only smart person in the room? Why did other people not pursue that strategy before that CEO, right? Oh, that, what, are they so brilliant? No, they're just you know convincing you of a story. And the more convincing they are, the more confident they are, the more likely you are to swallow that. And that will cause people to make bad decisions about who they should hire, who they should follow, instead of realizing that a simple story is very much not accurate about the reality of the situation. And you really need to dig under the hood, look at the data, use the example of Oakland Athletics. Now, how great would it be to have 20 
quarters in a row of profit uh, for you know high growth you know how, how many how much money would you give for that how much would you give for 20 profitable quarters in a row that's the equivalent of what Oakland athletics did by using numbers by using evaluation by using statistics and data to help make the right decisions not by going with the gut reactions of the scouts and who would be the right players I love that. And and you talk about 12 techniques to address dangerous judgment errors. And one of them I wanted to talk to you about, because I feel like, especially as leaders, business leaders, we tend to do this one. And you give an example of LOL and Time Warner, but it's about delaying our reactions and decisions. Yes. Delaying decision-making is a surprisingly powerful technique. So there are 12 techniques I talk about in the book. One of them is delaying our decision-making. This is incredibly important. You know, your mom might have taught you to count to 10 when you are about to make an important decision, or at least, you know, be, before giving an, import, an angry answer to your spouse. Let's hope that, <laughs> that you do that. Okay. That is, has been shown to actually work quite well, that specific technique, because the more we can delay our decision-making, the more we can step back from our initial triggering. We are triggered by whatever impulse. And we, if it's a threat, we have the fight or flight response. That's our natural intuition. Either flee from the information, from whatever the situation is that's uncomfortable, or fight, be aggressive, you know, fight back. That that is a bad response in almost all situations. So you want to step back from that right. and can't delay your decision making. When we feel you know, talked about sugar, when we're triggered by sugar, if we're able to instead Instead of eating more and more ice cream, stay step back and say, you know, let me wait for 10 seconds and not eat anything and think about what right. I want to do next. We're much more likely to stop and, you know, have some fruits or something like that. That is an effective technique. And the same thing should be applied in business so much, so often people make bad decisions in the moment, whether, you know, AOL Time Warner is a notorious example where very quickly after Time Warner bought AOL, AOL stock tanked very, very quickly, very quickly. So it went deeply, deeply underwater. That was the huge, the largest merger in history. And very quickly after it completed, the stock went, the stock you know, available stock went very much down. If they wait, if they delayed it, if they valued the, the situation a little bit more, Time Warner wouldn't have been nearly as screwed as it was. It was very damaging for Time Warner, very harmful. So that's an, an example that's coming from our history. But let's take a more recent example. Let's take a look at WeWork and what happened there. So WeWork was, of course, just a year ago, just about a year ago. Uh, if anyone can remember back to that time, it was valued at something like $75 billion, $75 billion for WeWork. Then, of course, it tried to go forward and do its IPO. And a lot of people told the, told the leadership of WeWork that, hey, you know, you want to wait. This is not the right time to go forward. This is not, you know, you want to make sure to address some of the governance issues we had because the CEO, Adam Newman, he had a lot of voting power and he had a lot of screwy relationships with WeWork. So for example, he would own a building and he would lease it out to WeWork. That That's bad. That You don't want that self-dealing, right. <laughs> especially when you're going for the IPO. But he rushed through it and he said, no, 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 we're going to do the IPO. It'll be great, guys. Yeah, trust me. He's one of the... Co- he, Adam Newman, by the way, is one of the great hype art- artists of our time. Very well known for being very charismatic, very inspiring. I mean, he got SoftBank to invest uh, many, many billions of dollars, over $18 billion of, uh, dollars into WeWork. So lots of money, lots of money was invested into WeWork. He got a lot of money invested into it for spinning nice stories about the future. You know, this will be the future. People will work in communes. Very hippie style, by the way, which was interesting. Right, right. But anyway, so he really went forward. He thought that he would be able to continue to spin his narrative in and make the IPO successful. They were initially pricing the IPO. So it was valued by SoftBank at around $75 billion. They were pricing in the initial IPO at $100 billion. I am, I am literally not kidding you. That's the, If you look at the records, that's what they were pricing the IPO at. Once the analysts, auditors, the people who don't really buy into stories that well, once they started digging into the finances of WeWork, you could see the IPO valuation slowly going down from 100 million to 80 billion, from 80 billion 
to 50 billion, from 50 billion to 30 billion. So really going down radically. And especially as they started figuring out the, the screwy governance structure of WeWork and the bad cash flow. Eventually, the IPO was called off and SoftBank came into the rescue, valuing the valuing WeWork at 7.5 billion. 7.5 billion when it was in late 2019, when it was in early 2019, valued at 75 billion and wanted the IPO at 100 billion. And of Mm. course, most recently, if you look at the most recent, when WeWork was, when SoftBank decided to pull out of its rescue of WeWork, it's the WeWork is valued at 2.9 billion. Now, Understand that 2.9 billion is the current valuation of WeWork mid May 2020. This is in the context of SoftBank spending, having spent already $18 billion. $18 billion on WeWork, and it's currently valued at 2.9 billion, the whole company. It's ridiculous, it's terrible. But this is what happens when you don't delay and when you don't look at the situation calmly and carefully from a variety of perspectives, when you let charismatic characters with nice stories and appealing narrative drive you forward to make really bad decisions. Yeah. And then on the other side of it, you have this, um, and you call it a pragmatic dangers of loss aversion. And you give a story, and I think there's a lot of leaders that are out there right now listening to this. And you have, uh, her name is Patricia. And she's overvalued the situation. Can you go, can you talk about pragmatic dangers of loss aversion? Sure. So with Patricia, she's a great example of loss aversion. But first of all, let's talk about what loss aversion is. Loss aversion is a really interesting phenomenon in our brains where we tend to dislike losing things more than we like gaining things. So that's it, it sounds simple, but it's really powerful. So if you give somebody, there was an interesting study where if you give somebody, you know, an undergraduate, a cup with a alma mater's logo, so you, you give them a cup, it's theirs, and you have two groups, one group of people whom you say, hey, how much would it cost you? How much would it take? How much do I have to pay you to give me the cup back that you now have and own? So the people who have a cup would say something like $5.50. That's how much it would take me to give up this cup that I have right now that, that was given to me the day, the previous day. Another group who were asked, how much would you pay to get this cup? They said something like two, $2.50. So $2.50. Same group, same undergraduates, you know, same psychology, same demographics. The difference is that one group were given the cup the day before and another group were just offered the cup if they want to buy it now. And that's an example of loss aversion. When we have something, we invest emotional resources into it. We become attached mm-hmm. to it. And a, rela- a type of loss aversion, uh, which I talk about in the book, a subtype of it is called the Ikea effect. Now, you might remember Ikea as the Swedish furniture store. We know that when somebody builds buys something from Ikea and builds the furniture, they value it at much higher than it should be valued on the open market. They they feel, you know, same thing when somebody does home improvement on their house. So when they do home improvement on their house, I mean, heck, I did home improvement on my house, you know, and I did work in my backyard. I value that house and the work that I did much more than it's objectively valued on the open market. And that's what people do. Unfortunately, I know this about myself. So if I would be selling the house, I would go to a realtor and I'd say, let's evaluate it objectively, you know, maybe go a little bit higher than the objective value just, you know, for negotiation room. But most people would not. Most people would say, well, I put in $50,000 of work on this house. Therefore, it should be worth 50000 more. That's not how it works. The same thing happens very problematically when people try to sell a business. Very bad, very problematic. When they try to sell a business, they they price it at much, much more than it's worth. This is so, so problematic. When I talk to my clients about who want to sell a business, they go ahead and they want to price it at something like 10 times revenue, 10 times, I mean, uh, 10 times profit. That's the what I typically see my clients want at, at 10 times profit. That's the, what they want to sell a business for. When I tell them that usually businesses sell for two to three times profit, the annual profit, they are shocked. They don't realize that that's what people typically pay for businesses. And this right. is so often the problem. So let's go to Patricia. So she is a CPA and she was thinking about deciding whether to leave her job. 
So she was thinking about, well, so again, CPA, she knew the math. She knew, she understood the math on loss aversion, on how challenging it was. And she was felt reluctant to change her situation. She was in a situation where she was not getting promoted. She wasn't getting the kind of recognition that she wanted to get. But she was reluctant to leave her job because, you know, she liked the job. She liked the comfort of staying in the job. She didn't want to leave the job. But at the same time, she wanted to progress in her career. And that's a big problem. Lots of people stay in jobs. You know, I wouldn't call them dead end jobs, but in jobs that they're not really making progress. There was another. I was talking to another um, co- to another coaching client about when was it? about three months ago, who was working in a financial services company. So she was working. Um, she gave me a testimonial, so I'm more comfortable with discussing her. She she worked as a manager. She works still works as a manager, regional manager. She does great sales but she doesn't have a bachelor's degree. So because she doesn't have a bachelor's degree, she gets passed over in promotion quite frequently. This is a problem, though, of course, that she gets passed over in promotion for younger people who have bachelor degrees, even though she's producing really great, she produces a lot, she's the best regional producer in in her area. And what we talked about was, hey, you know, do you want to stay in this job or not? What what is the reality? She's scared. She's worried about leaving it because it's a nice job. She gets paid two hundred thousand per year, so it's a quite nice salary. But she keeps getting passed over her promotion. So the same thing I told her. The same thing that I told Patricia that I talk about in the book. You know, what do you think? How would you feel about staying in this job in the same place five years from now? And both. Patricia and the client who I'm talking about had the same visceral, very negative response. They are like, no, absolutely not. You know, I can't imagine myself staying in the same job five years from now. But of course, if they just thought about tomorrow and the next week and the next month, they would stay in this job because that's how loss aversion functions. We're afraid to lose what we have right now for the sake of a much better outcome, much more gains in the future. This is a bad problem for us. This is something that we really need to address. And it really helps to think about the long-term future. That's one of the strategies I talk about that is very effective. You want to think about the long-term future. Five years from now is a base default baseline that I talk about to my coaching clients, consulting clients. You know, Think about five years from now. Envision, have that clear vision of the outcome of five years from now. Where do you want to be? What do you want to achieve? What do you want to see happening five years from now? And that really helps them move past their loss aversion right now, their fear of making a change and helping them let go of that fear by seeing that, hey, you know, you don't, you don't want to be stuck in the same situation five years from now, wherever you're going. No, I love that. And one of the things that you have in the book is you talk about, um, and and I, I want to get into this, and then one more thing, and I know for sake of time, I want to make sure that I'm being respectful of that. But you talk about um, VW or Volkswagen yes, and, and, and the ostrich effect. And I really think that a lot of times we do this, and I think this is what's kind of happening with COVID-19 right now. Yes, yes, it's unfortunate. So there's a, I talk about a study by Leadership IQ, first of all, which interviewed 1,087 board members from 286 organizations of various sorts that four-starred their CEOs. So it looked at these organizations, uh, looked at the study, pretty comprehensive study, right? It found that almost that over a fifth of these CEOs, something like 23% got fired for denying reality. Denying reality. What that means is that they refused to recognize very clearly negative facts about the situation of the company. They were just, they, they had their stuck head stuck in the sand like the mythical ostrich. That is what the, happened. And Volkswagen, I'll talk about Volkswagen, but I, I want to make sure to bring up Boeing as a more recent example. So let's think about what happened with Boeing and the 737 MAX. That's, of course, a big problem. So and the CEO, Dennis Spielenberger. But so what happened with 737 MAX? Well, of course, we know that the 737 MAX had so many problems, crashed twice, 346 million people died. That's terrible. But let's talk about what happened, acknowledging that. Let's talk about what happened with Boeing as it said, as it wanted to recover from that situation. So what Boeing did was the, the CEO, Dennis Spielenberg, when the 737 MAX was grounded in March 2019, said, okay, 
you know, we'll be flying by May. Definitely great. Well, I, April was finishing up. The 737 MAX was clearly staying grounded. He said, you know, we'll be flying by August. Should, we'll definitely get approval. You know, end of July, not clearly not happening in August. He said, okay, we'll be flying by October. Yeah, definitely. End of, you know, September approaching, not happening. He said, well, okay, definitely by the end of the year. December, we're flying, absolutely. December approaching, end of December, he said, sorry, guys, you know, we'll, we'll just have to push this into March. We'll definitely be flying by March. And the board of Boeing fired him. So Dennis Miller <laughs> at that point was fired. And the board clearly, explicitly said that they fired him for denying the negative reality about the approval process taking way longer than so many times that he said it would be approved and the approval process would take way longer than he actually said it would. So he was undermining Boeing's credibility in the eyes of so many people. More and more over time, Boeing's credibility was undermined. People were canceling orders right and left, not simply because the 737 MAX was screwed up. That was a big problem. But just as bad was how Dennis Muhlenberg and the rest of the board and the rest of the leadership team handled the post-fact problem. So that's something that happened recently and in the U.S. This doesn't, of course, happen only in the U.S. It's in September 2015, there was a gi- the German giant car giant Volkswagen. It acknowledged, admitted that it used cheating software in its cars to give them false readings when the to give false readings when the cars underwent emissions test. And that's called Dieselgate for those folks who remember it. You know, not, not too long ago, but that's the kind of the situation. This was really bad for the car industry. And of course, they used these false readings so that it's uh, VW and Audi cars that they were able to accelerate fast on the roads, but they gave false acceleration, false emissions when they were undergoing testing. This resulted in the eventual resignation of the CEO, Martin Wittenkorn, a number of leaders. The Volkswagen stock fell by more than 40%, 40% throughout the next few days after September 2015. The overall cost of the scandal of the company was estimated at more than $20 billion. By compar- comparison, the Boeing scandal and the 737 MAX and the poor, very poor choices of Dennis Muhlenberg and others at uh, Boeing was estimated to cost $25 billion. So these are huge, huge costs which come from denying reality, from denying the negative facts about reality. And this is one of the biggest problems that we face. There was an interesting a study by a Harvard Business School professor, Richard Tedlow, who talked, who found that this culture of denialism goes from the top down overwhelmingly. It comes from the CEOs. CEOs set the culture for the rest of the company. If they deny reality, if they feel that, hey, because I'm so competent and I'm so confident, therefore the company can't be doing anything wrong. And all of these you know, negative facts about reality, which I'm hearing, you know, when Den- when um, Boeing was the CEO and the leadership team. They had facts about the negative problems with 737 Max from inside the company. When you know pilots were pilot technical pilot was saying he sent an email inside the email which was revealed in January 2020 that the, the 737 Max is you know designed by monkeys, supervised by clowns. And I'm quoting here: <laughs> designed by monkeys, supervised by clowns. Real phrase from real email. They had that information, but they were ignoring. They said, you know, hey, we bow uh, our planes are safe because we're Boeing and we have safe planes. Therefore, it can't be not safe. That's the way that negative reality comes about. So denying of re- of reality. That's a big problem, and you, we need to address the ostrich effect for so many CEOs because otherwise they just fail to face reality clearly. Yeah, and it, and it can be more like your book talks about. It can be more than just costing money. It can eventually cost you your company, like you mentioned, Circuit City. Yes, Circuit City was a big problem. So Circuit City was a great example of a company which, of course, was, I mean, it was doing fine at a certain point, but it was, uh, it really made a bad mistake in, in its play for television. So I remember Circuit City, I used to shop there, actually, you know, I'm that old. It was, uh, 
I was actually a graduate student at UNC Chapel Hill when I was doing that. And at the time, I was doing both academic work and my neuroscience and, cogn- and behavioral economics, and I was moonlighting as a consultant coach. And I shopped at Circuit City, so that was you know a nice place. What happened with the reality of the situation in that where in that was that the fl- the Circuit City made a big bet on flat panel TV sales. Flat panel TV sales, if you remember way back to that time, about a decade ago, the CEO, Philip Schoonover, who's you know pretty competent in many ways, he made a big bet on it. He thought, he thought that, hey, the Circuit City revenue model can focus on these flat panel TV screens. While flat panel TVs, they sold at Circuit City for 2400 in the fall of 2005, so $2,400. Only a year later, there was a strong competition, big price wars in Circuit City. So Walmart, Costco, and so on offered them for about $1,000. So in a year, the price fell from $2,400 to $1,000. That really Mm -hmm. undercut the Circuit City business model. And they didn't realize that that was going to happen. They didn't see the future, that their business model was dependent on something, so they sold the, the flat panel TV screens and accessories. Their business model was dependent on something that was very risky, incredibly risky. You know, when you're the CEO of a company, you're really the chief risk officer. That's your real role as the chief risk mm-hmm. officer. And that is what you need to be doing. You need to be addressing risks, addressing problems, you know, because the company fails under your watch. That's the biggest problem that you have. And if you place your big bet of your whole business model on one product, that's not, you know, there was nothing patented or copyrighted around the flat panel TV screens. That's something that anybody can produce. And, you know, you have Chinese producers producing them anyway for Circuit City, for Walmart, for Costco. That was a big problem. And he made a very bad bet that put his coal company on the line for, on something that he couldn't control on what other retailers did. That's never something you should do. And that's a big problem when you try to do the same sort of thing. You want to be very careful about what kind of risks you manage, how you manage risks. You, you are as the CEO, as the leader of a company, whether you run a small business, whether you run a large company, you are the chief risk officer. And you want to be aware of what kind of risks you're placing your company under and how you can manage those risks in the most effective way. And Philip Schoenover just did very simple, very basic, very frustrating for me because it was so simple and so idiotic, bad risk analysis. Yeah, and Dr. Sapersky, in in your book, and and I want to have this in closing, if you could speak to this, you you say this, you say, wise leaders thereby subtly balance humility during the decision-making process with confidence after the decision is made. And then you said, the most valuable resource is our attention. Yes. So, balancing humility during the decision-making process with confidence after the decision-making is made. That is a crucial element. Humility is humility about the quality of our decisions. We are, as human beings, inherently biased. This is just fundamentally what we are. And this is where we need to differentiate the quality of our decision-making process. We need to be humble. We need to not trust ourselves. This is so important. We cannot trust ourselves during the decision-making process. We need to get, using the steps I outlined earlier, you need to get information from other sources. You need to weigh the various criteria before you generate options. You need to generate a bunch of viable options. That is all about humility. That's all about not trusting your gut, realizing that our guts are flawed. They're not adapted for the modern world. We need to be very humble when we're going for the decision-making process. That is incredibly important. So developing the quality of humility when you're making your decisions, especially the more important decisions, is going to be super important, critical for you to make the right decisions as you're going forward. I mean, especially in the most major decisions. There's a reason that research shows that about 70 to 90% of mergers and acquisitions fail. It's one of the biggest decisions that a business can make. And overwhelmingly, merger and acquisition decisions are made emotionally. I mean, you might be surprised to hear this. And despite all the work that goes into merger and acquisition decisions, the more important the decision is, the more often the business leadership makes the top leader, the CEO, or the small leadership team, 
makes it themselves without getting outside assistance. They make it kind of in that small room and they make it based on feeling, based on gut reactions. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, I'm not sure whether, you know, it's like, hey, I don't know the data. You know, we don't have the right data. So let's go with how we feel. That's a very bad approach. So you need to be very humble when you're making the decision and you go through the why steps. Once you make the decision, that's a different thing. Once you make the decision and you decide on how you'll revise it, you know, maximize uh, success, minimize failure, decide on the revision points. We talked about having metrics. Then you want to motivate people. You want to motivate yourself. You want to motivate others. That's where you show confidence. That is the right place for confidence because you've done your best. You know, if you know that you've done your best going for the decision making process, then you want to go with the decision, implement it effectively, execute it. Don't try to turn back. Don't try to second guess yourself. Go forward, execute effectively. So that's what we want to orient toward. The problem is that leaders too often they miss. They, we combine, they conflate the external displays of confidence, which are very important for inspiring others, for motivating them to go forward with feeling internally confident about our judgments. We are all human. We are all flawed. We need to not be confident about our inherent judgment. We need to be confident after we go for the process. You should be confident not about your gut, but you should be confident about the process. That's what you should be confident about. Humble about yourself, confident about the process, and then confident about the outcome of the process and drive the outcome of the process forward. So that is the right combination for leaders who want to be truly successful. Yes, and you have a a questionnaire in the back of the book, and I want to encourage everybody, they can go to Amazon right now, and you, uh, you can type it in and it'll even fill it in for you. It's never go with your gut, how pioneering leaders make the best decisions and avoid business disasters. And Dr. Sapersky, how's the, what's the best way people can follow you? The best way to follow me is to check out my website, and that has links to all of my social media and everything else, disasteravoidanceexperts.com. Again, disasteravoidanceexperts.com. There's blogs, videos, podcasts, you know, right now virtual consulting, coaching, training, uh, webinars, online classes. Especially check out disasteravoidanceexperts.com for a free eight video-based course on making the wisest decisions. Again, disasteravoidanceexperts.com forward slash subscribe for a free eight video based class on making the wisest decisions. Finally, I'm really available on LinkedIn. So connect with me there. That's my favorite social media. Just type in Dr. Gleb Tsipurski. You should find me and let me know that you heard me on the show. And if you have any questions about anything, I'll be happy to discuss them. Dr. Gleb Tsipurski on LinkedIn, G-L-E-B-T-S-I-P-U-R-S-K-Y. Perfect. And I'll make sure I put that in the show notes. Uh, Dr. Sapersky, I'm really excited. I really enjoyed this podcast. It was extremely informative. And I just want to thank you because I know if people follow these steps um, in their decision making, it's going to help them. You know, not we always talk about business, but it's going to help them in their personal life, too. And that that's something that, you know, to be able to avoid an outcome in a relationship or whatever it may be. Um, that, that to me, that is where you could look at this and say, okay, I know my emotions are, are here, but I know if I do these steps, I can get to an outcome that's probably going to be not just profitable for my business, but be helpful in my personal life. So I, I just want to thank you for doing this book. And is there anything you would like to leave with anyone before, before we go? Well, thank you for your kind words. And I do very much care about personal life. This is why my new book, Resilience, Adapt and Plan for the New Abnormal of the COVID-19 Coronavirus Pandemic, covers business. 75% of it is devoted to business decision-making, career decision-making, but 25% of it is devoted to how individuals should plan for their households and adapting to the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. This is really important for me. So that's what I want to leave people with. I want them to be thinking about how to effectively plan and adapt the situation to the current needs, to the current crisis. You want to make, this is especially important to make the right decisions in the current crisis in the current emergency in the current new abnormal as i call it because there's much less room for maneuver and much more to lose if you make the wrong decisions so that's what i want to leave people with well thank you dr spursky i appreciate it i'll make sure that i put all the links in the show notes and i hope you and your family stay safe and thank you for being on the abq business podcast thank you so much for inviting me jason really appreciate it 
Thank you for joining us on the Albuquerque Business Podcast. And thanks to our sponsor, RigbyDigital.com. Make sure to subscribe and share. And go to ABQPodcast.com. Get show notes, resources, and links to everything we talked about today to help you navigate your journey as an entrepreneur and business owner.